Hey everybody, Eric Chesson, founder of Autism Fitness here. And if you are ready to become an Autism Fitness Certified Pro, join the movement for movement and create the best possible, most meaningful, actually effective, transcend the gym or fitness setting to real life programs for your autism or neurodiverse population, then head on over to autismfitness.com and register right now. You can begin your coursework as soon as you register and then join me for one of our live virtual practicals held throughout the year in different time zones as well. That is the Autism Fitness Level 1 certification. The link is in the description for this video down below. And in today's Tuesday training, what we are going to cover is a big word. It's multisyllabic too, or polysyllabic. I think those two interchange. Anyway, we're going to be talking about approximations in exercise. One of the most important, I find myself saying that a lot, like one of the most, but it is one of the most important concepts when we refer to physical functioning. That means the performance of the exercise. So in our PAC profile methodology, we have physical, adaptive, and cognitive. So right now we're focusing on the physical. Word number one, is the polysyllabic one, approximations. An approximation is when there is a developing or emerging skill that we see, and it's not quite there yet. It's not exactly what we need it to be. It's not yet at the point where the athlete is completely independent with it, but it's getting there. That's where we're starting. So we have the approximation. And then we have the process of shaping, which is gradually coaching and cueing or prompting the exercise or the movement so that it is improving. So we start typically, unless the athlete already has this physical skill mastered with an approximation, and we are shaping it in order to get the movement better and better. One of the exercises where this becomes the most challenging, and we cover this a lot in the Autism Fitness Level 1 certification, is in the scoop throw. Now, the scoop throw is an introduction to the hinge movement. It is not a complete hinge. It's more of a hinge quasi swing movement with the hips. But what we're doing is we're getting the, the hips into a really good athletic position. And this is the key to, if we want to talk about what life skill this is, go, it is going to cross over or generalize to, we can talk about picking things up off the floor, especially heavy things safely and effectively so that we are, um, we, we are not initiating a movement pattern that eventually is going to lead to low back pain and some dysfunction as well. So the scoop throws are initiation to that movement. And you can see when we talk about <clears throat> low back pain and we talk about um, um, hip mechanics right here, I'm glad I paused at this moment because what we're seeing here is what a lot of our athletes have a tendency to do. Now, the foot position looks really good. And what we want in the scoop throw, as opposed to the push or overhead throw, with the push or overhead throw, we want the feet about shoulder width so that we have nice base stability um, on, on the floor and we have rooting. Talk about that a lot. What we want with the scoop throw, because it's different, very different from the push or overhead throw, is we want the athlete's head up and we want what we call a neutral spine, which means the back is flat. You can see with this athlete here, he's starting out. And again, this is where we talk about the approximation of, of the movement. So feet, and you can see we have the uh, marker right here, I have, the, I have his circle marker down there. Feet are in a really good position. Knees are in a really good position. Hips are good and that low back is rounded here. So that's something that gradually we want to shape and get to a more neutral position. Right? So in this case, he did not want the ring there, which is fine as long as he's taking that wide stance. Now you see there, way better position. Feet are a little bit wider than we would want, 
but he's able to maintain that nice rooted position here. So you can see he's setting up now watching the setup. I'm going to come back to this because this is important. So watching the setup, he roots his feet and now watch. What we want out of this exercise are the hips going back, the hands coming between the knees here, and then using the legs and the hips, not the arms, the legs and the hips to move the ball forward, to propel the ball forward, to create the power and generate the power to move that ball. Watch what happens. So that was all arm right there. And you can see, again, all arm and losing some stability there. So this athlete has the basic, and there we go into a push throw. So this athlete has the basic premise and the basic idea of this scoop throw. However, in execution, we're seeing, we're seeing a lot that needs to, again, be shaped. So here's where people go wrong. Here's where coaching goes wrong. Here's where the wheels start falling off. Explaining things to the athlete. And this is their, their cognitive functioning or their ability to communicate or their ability to receive information aside. Explaining all of this to an athlete is going to lead to zero progress. This is not something that we are going to explain. Rather, this is something that we need to keep demonstrating and something that we need to keep cueing for the athlete. And this can be a lengthy process. Do not give up. However, the more we explain what we want the athlete to do, the less it's going to be functional for them. Right there, I want to point out that that was an awesome catch on my part going forward. But what I did here, going back, so I'm getting the athlete into position now. As opposed to before, what do we see? We see rooting, right? We see the athlete in a much better position, both starting with the ball here between the knees. And then we can actually see his face, which is a good thing. That means the head is up. So we have a better opportunity for neutral spine here. Now he throws it. And this is, I'd say, atypical. This is not the usual thing that happens. He threw it before I got back to the spot, which is fine. So he's in a good position here, right? Grabbing the ball. Again, this is fine. And throwing with the arms again. This is not a process that happens automatically. Our athlete needs to get here. So he's bending his knees. He's putting it all together. If you think about it, he has all of the components. It is putting them all together and executing them in a way where the arms are doing what the arms need to be doing, the hips are doing what the hips need to be doing, the feet are doing what the feet need to be doing, and the head is doing what the head needs to be doing. And this is going to take practice. So we might step in with that prompt and get the athlete into position. Again, his feet are a little wider than they need to be right now. So we clear that up first because feet first, we want to set up those feet. And there again, we see that throw with the arms. So this, and then back to the push throw. So what's, what's fascinating about this also is we're looking at when we talk about motor planning, this nebulous thing that is motor planning, this is what we're talking about. Sequencing a movement pattern that is multi-step, right? Not step as in just locomotion, but steps as in what do I need to do first, second, third, fourth in order for this movement to happen. Now, of course, the athlete is not necessarily thinking that in stages, but the motor planning component of it is how do I need to or how can I do this? Now, here again, this is a work in progress. This is the approximation for the scoop throw. And there's clearly work to be done. So we step back in, or I step back in, set him up, right? And when he's prompted, he can do it. That was a little bit better also. So the thing that we need to keep in mind here is that most of our athletes are not going to start off mastering the exercise, particularly a movement like the scoop throw, which while valuable can be very difficult. 
So we want to start out, first of all, we always assess. We need to know baseline. We don't just start randomly anywhere. We need to know where the athlete is starting so we can know how to get them to where they need to be. This is going to be a process, right? So the rules are, rule number one, assess so you know where the athlete is starting with that scoop throw. Number two, figure out where you need to prompt or cue so that they are in a good athletic position. And number three is be consistent with your prompt and your cue until you can fade it back. So that hinge is going to be valuable over the course of that athlete's lifetime, both in the short term and in the long term. It makes sense to teach it. And when we teach it, the expectation is that we are gradually going to improve the form and not just leave it and say, okay, well, that's what they can do. So that's it. Yes, that's what they can do now. Our job as a coach or a trainer or a therapist or whoever you are is to bridge that gap so that they meet that goal. And one fantabulous way to do that is to become an autism fitness certified pro and learn how to use these methods and these strategies in your own fitness and adaptive PE program. So again, the link to the autism fitness certification is in the description below. I'm Eric Jessen, founder of Autism Fitness. If this has been helpful, please share it with other people. Like, subscribe, all of those things, and I will see you for the next Tuesday training.